Mars is primarily known as the Roman god of war. He's also the god of rage, destruction and passion, and, surprisingly, agriculture. As Peter Carney puts it, Mars is a protector of both fighters and food. In some traditions, he even has a healing aspect, so it's fair to say that there is perhaps more to this god than it would first appear. I've certainly been surprised by what I found while researching this episode. So come with me and let's get to know Mars a little bit better. We'll first look at his history in Roman mythology and then we'll have a look to see how he was worshipped when the Romans brought him to Britain. So let's get on with this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I hope that your mate is treating you well. It's all been a bit weird at this end, mainly because of the fact that we're starting to come towards the end of the term at work. So it's kind of strange sort of realising that the, the students are going to be leaving and it's all going to be a little bit kind of frantic with assessment and stuff. So doing this episode this week really has been quite fun for me for various reasons, but partly because of the fact that A, I got to learn stuff that I literally didn't know before, but B, it has also been quite a nice little diversionary thing from everything else. One of the other things I did, because I'm really good at procrastinating, is I finally set up a Fabulous Folklore Facebook page. So I haven't really decided what I'm going to do with it yet, but it's just if you want to get any kind of like updates on episodes and links to stuff and things like that. So basically the kind of stuff that I currently put on my Facebook page, I'm thinking of moving it over to the Fabulous Folklore one. So if you do want to like it, the link is in the show notes below. And what's really funny is I'm literally pointing below while I'm talking, forgetting that you can't actually see it. But never mind, we are just going to dive into this week's episode because there's a lot to cover. And like I said, we are doing Roman gods in Britain, but I wanted to give a little bit of backstory for Mars because there's quite a lot of it. And while he hasn't got quite the same breadth of myths, as in he's not involved in quite as many or necessarily quite as many classic ones compared to a figure like Minerva or Jupiter, who obviously we will be meeting next week, Mars does have quite a lot of stuff of his own going on, which is actually quite shameful in in one respect, but also quite cool in another. So in ancient Rome, Mars actually ruled as part of the Archaic Triad, and that was alongside Jupiter and Quirinus. Now, Quirinus is the deified version of Romulus, one of the mythical founders of Rome. Incidentally, Romulus was also one of Mars's sons, and this is the part that is one of his terrible moments, because... Basically what happened was he took a fancy to Rhea Silvia, the Vestal Virgin, and he raped her while she slept. And she obviously woke up, realised what had happened, and found herself pregnant with Romulus and Remus. And then Romulus ends up going on and found Rome. That's not really the point of this episode, because basically, because Mars was their father, he then became the father of the Roman people via their founding of Rome. He was often shown as a bearded man in statues, and he was either clothed in military attire or totally nude. He was always one or the other. And he would usually carry a spear with him, and his spear represented his warlike aspect, but it was often adorned by a laurel, which would represent peace. There are, as I say, quite a lot of representations of a nude Mars, and some people think this is symbolic of the rawness of his power. And it's quite funny when you look at the statues of nude Mars compared to some of the other deities when they're nude. He sort of is just lying around like, yeah, and like there's there's something really totally unbothered about the way that he's depicted, which is quite interesting. Now, he did lose his primacy to Minerva as Rome pivoted from a city-state to an empire because Minerva, like the Greek goddess Athena, was also a war goddess and she actually focused on tactics and strategy. So where you can see Mars as being sort of the actually getting stuck in and doing the fighting part of war, Minerva was essentially the tactics and the strategy that you'd need. So you can't win a war without strategy, but at the same time, all the strategy in the world won't help if you don't have fighting prowess. So in this regard, the two of them became quite complementary war deities. 
Now, even though he did lose his place as second in command, Mars did still command a lot of respect. And Romulus, according to Ovid, actually named March for Mars. So essentially, the first month of the year, because March was the first month of the year, then became named for Mars. And Ovid actually notes that the ancients respected Mars beyond all. And the naming of March after the god is important for two reasons. First, it's the planting season and the start of the military year. And this connection is going to become important in a moment. And second, it also marks the start of the Roman Lunar New Year. So Mars was essentially so important in Rome that his month starts the year. Now, there were various festivals held throughout March for Mars. And according to Robert G. Herber, the three sort of quite major ones were on the 1st, the 14th and the 19th. And I know the one on the 14th involved a lot of horse racing and so on. And you'd find there were quite a lot of warrior priests, or Sally as they were called, who were associated with the worship of the god. And they would basically carry shields through Rome and they would sing songs to praise him as they did so. And again, Herber suggests the combination of armour and dancing could actually mean that this dance was a fertility rite, but not for people, but rather to try and help the crops grow because the fact that these march ceremonies fell during an important period for agriculture. So it is entirely possible that rather than it being a fertility right for people, it was actually for the fields. The Romans also held celebratory festivals in Mars' honour in October, which is the end of the military year, and he was also honoured at military festivities or any victory celebrations, for obvious reasons. Now, the Romans would sacrifice bulls and rams to Mars. They would also sacrifice horses at these horse racing things, which seems like a really bizarre way to celebrate the winning horse that you would then sacrifice it to a god, but there we go. And like I said earlier, the laurel was sacred to him, probably through its connotations with victory, but that is quite interesting given its connection with the god Apollo. Other birds and animals that were associated with Mars were wolves, snakes and woodpeckers, which I think is quite a motley crew as well. Now, we should have a quick look at the festivals, though, because they did have a purification element. And this is where you start to see that perhaps he wasn't just this, like, warmongering god. Because these festivals might remove malign influences that had already attached themselves to particularly soldiers, or they would prevent these influences from becoming attached in future. Now, this association with purification at his festivals really does make Mars much more of a protective war god. In March, the rites were to protect the warriors and their equipment in the coming months of battle, and then the October rites were there to cleanse them, having been at war. Now, if we do extend this a little bit further, Mars's function as a war god is essentially protect his followers and the city, not necessarily to go out on the offensive. Now, Vincent J. Rosovac actually further suggests that Mars was originally a local god in the pre-Roman era and that every community in the area actually had their own version to provide protection. And these were then differentiated by the latter part of like a two-handled name. So you get figures like Mars Quirinus. And as Rome then expanded to become a city-state, all of these other Marses were then absorbed into the Roman deity to become just Mars. He was then identified with Ares, the Greek god of war, and then this cemented his transition into a war god from an agricultural deity. Now, Mars does share quite a lot of mythology with Ares, but they do have one really fundamental difference. And it's quite interesting in a way because Ares is almost universally disliked, but he was an entirely destructive god. So he was all about desolation and just like general bloodthirstiness. Whereas Mars, on the other hand, preferred conflicts that ultimately ended in peace. So in his regard, yes, he's still after war, but it's basically in order to secure peace. He had quite a lot of names and some of those include Mars Pater or Mars the Father, Mars Gradivus or Marching Mars and Mars Quirinus, which was Mars of the Quirites. And each of these names essentially provided a different persona for the god. So one version might be present on the battlefield, while another one would defend the common man and bring peace. And this flexibility becomes really important when we get to the section about Roman Britain. But before we do that, just a little note on Mars's family tree. So his parents were ostensibly Jupiter and Juno, although there is a version told by Ovid that he actually had no father. And Juno hated the fact that Jupiter had produced Minerva without a mother. She wanted to produce a child without a father in retaliation. And it was actually Flora, the goddess of flowers and fertility, that she turned to. 
and Flora gave Juno a special flower that could induce pregnancy without a male. Now, she did try it out first on a heifer who had previously been unable to conceive, and she quite happily conceived. So Juno then tried this flower herself, and this helped her conceive Mars. I have found some tales where the flower was a foxglove, but in most versions it doesn't actually say what the flower was. Now, Mars did have siblings, so he had sisters, which were the war goddess Bologna and the goddess of youth Juventus, and then his brother was Vulcan, the god of metalworking, and he was the Roman equivalent of Hephaestus, who we met months ago when we did blacksmithing. Now, Mars did have plenty of consorts, although very few of the myths actually see him with a long-term partner in the same way that you get between some of the other deities. His best-known consort is Venus, which obviously is the wife of his brother Vulcan, Although one tradition does see him marry Anna Perenna, who's a goddess of time. And this is quite an interesting myth and again comes from Ovid, because according to this particular tale, Mars falls for Minerva, who then rebuffs his advantage because she's a virgin goddess and has no interest in marrying anyone, let alone Mars. So Mars goes to Anna Perenna for help, but Anna's decided she quite fancies Mars herself. So she disguises herself as Minerva and then actually agrees to marry Mars. Mars is obviously over the moon about this, quite happily goes ahead with the wedding. And it's only after the marriage has become binding that Anna reveals the truth. Clearly this infuriates Mars because he's now trapped in a marriage that he didn't actually consent to. Which you could argue he's possibly not got the best grasp on consent himself, but there we go. They apparently did go on to have a somewhat fiery relationship as a result. Now, he is obviously most famous for his affair with Venus, with whom he did have several children, and they included Timor, the god of fear, and Timor's twin sister, Concordia, who was the goddess of harmony and peace, which I think looks like quite an interesting pairing to have there. And finally, there was Cupid, who perhaps represents the best parts of each of his parents. Now, as you would expect, there is plenty of material evidence for the worship of Mars in Britain. And this is most likely due to his popularity with the army, who had strong tendencies towards dedicating altars. So it's really easy to find evidence of where these are. For example, there's one that I saw almost have been last year in August at the Arbea Roman Fort in South Shields. And there's just this this Mars altar that you can go in and see. Now, evidence of the worship is prevalent along Hadrian's Wall because this obviously was the northern frontier of the Roman Empire. And if you go to somewhere like Vindolanda, which is fantastic and I highly recommend it, it does have statues of him and it's got various other things with him on. And he's usually depicted naked on them, but he's armed with a shield, helmet and spear. So I like the fact that he's covering the essentials basically there. And also, one of the elements of Roman life that often captures the imagination of contemporary people is the curse tablet. And if anybody would like me to do an episode on curses in general, do let me know. That's just popped into my head. Now, 130 of these cursed tablets were found at Bath and they're written on lead. And basically, people were calling on Sullis Minerva to curse those who'd wronged them. But these tablets are also found elsewhere in Britain and they just have a different god named on them. And Mercury apparently has the most curses devoted to him, but there are quite a few that also invoke Mars as well. Now, the thing with the Romans, it's a little bit different with their deities, as they often equated their god of war with the British gods that they encountered along the way. And this included, among many others, Casidius and Bella Tucadris along Hadrian's Wall. And in both cases, the Roman god then becomes the Romano-British, Mars Casidius and Mars Bella Tucadris. Really wish that was easier to say. Now, interestingly, Cassidius's name actually translates to Red God, and he was considered a warrior lord at the western end of Hadrian's Wall, so there is an assumption anyway that the Red God part somehow relates to bloodletting in some way. It isn't, however, so simple to really say that the Romans just absorbed local gods wherever they encountered them because religions did actually coexist in Roman Britain, so you would still get people worshipping Celtic deities alongside Roman ones. And essentially what they did was they just syncretized them at the crossover point. So part of this is because the Roman army wasn't entirely from Rome. So the troops would be recruited elsewhere and they would bring their own gods with them as well. Which is why you get this huge diversity of Romano-British gods. Some of them are more Romano-Gaulish gods and so on. But it is quite interesting to see how they put different deities together to then sort of say, oh, we've got we've got a new figure here. 
Now, James Hunter actually points out that Mars was already a versatile god when he arrived in Britain, having gone from an agricultural deity to the father of Rome to the empire's main war god. So it was incredibly easy for him to then just take on extra responsibilities depending on the community or group that worshipped him in Britain. Hunter gives the example of an inscription to Mars Macodius in Colchester. On one hand, Macodius could refer to a Celtic deity worshipped by the person dedicating the plaque, and read in this light, it's likely that Macodius would be a war god. But on the other hand, a translation of the word can also imply heavy drinking, so the person could entirely have been thanking Mars for alcohol or simply honouring a Roman or Celtic version of the god. There's loads of other versions of these, so I'm not going to go into all of them because there's tons of them. And Hunter does point out that it wasn't really as simple as simply matching Celtic gods with Roman gods that had the same function. So what they actually did was they more or less used Mars as a label to go, this god is Roman. But then the Celtic god actually provided the specific function. And in this case, the Celtic name dictates how the god functions and then Mars was the one who was actually adapted to correspond. In some cases, the Celtic deity strength made him almost redundant, and then in others, they actually used the Roman god to intensify whatever it was that the Celtic god symbolised. Now, obviously, the other advantage that you have with Mars is the god of war had very recognisable iconography, which makes it really easy to spot them across the regional variations. So even where you find the really early Celtic deities, just where the crossover starting to happen, even though they're depicted in this really sort of Celtic way, you can still go that Mars because he's got the iconography there. And it does also help to explain why his function might change even if his iconography doesn't. So as Hunter notes, the figure of Mars at a fort would symbolise his role as a god of war, but a rural worker might use the exact same figure to protect his harvest because obviously the iconography therefore depends on the protective aspect of Mars rather than anything else. So as you can see as we draw this bumper episode to a close, it's not as simple as calling Mars a war god and just leaving it at that. So when you actually separate him from the myths around Ares, a slightly different figure emerges. And yes, Holst was right to call Mars the bringer of war when he did the planet suite, but Mars did so in order to effect peace, not just simply to go rah and attack people. And yes, I did just mime rah as I did that. Now, Mars' protective nature becomes quite an interesting addition, and he acts as both the father of the Roman people, the guardian of the crops, and also the protective force overseeing the military. Now, this flexibility really does make him the ideal deity for Roman Britain, because troops recruited far from Rome could align him with their own gods, or they could place him alongside the local gods of the forts in which they found themselves. And here his name and iconography functions as a recognisable theme, while his local name provided him a specific role. And while a lot of these extra functions have largely been forgotten and warfare is clearly never the answer, we can at least turn to Mars for his protection and his agricultural role because quite frankly, the land needs all the protection it can get as well. What I would love to know then is what's your take on Mars. I really did have a particular impression of him before I started doing that research and I was quite pleasantly surprised by what I found. So I'd love to know what other people think. If you have a favourite piece from the planet suite, please do feel free to let me know. Mine is clearly Mars followed by Jupiter, but I am quite biased towards both of them. Anyway, that is the end of this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you enjoyed getting to know Mars a little bit better. Next week, we are going to be moving on to Jupiter, who is obviously the king of the gods. So it'll be interesting to see what we manage to dig up. And because May is a five Saturday month, we are going to round out the month with Antinocyticus, who is a local god to me, who some people have heard of, but not all. But he's also quite interesting because he's quite mysterious and he's I, I just think he's brilliant. So we are going to meet a Celtic god in Roman Britain as well, because why not? So I hope you enjoyed that. The Patreon exclusive episode for May is going to be looking at folklore of sort of features of the land around things like stones and mountains and all things earthy I guess really so I hope you'll enjoy that as well if you are a Patreon supporter at the 350 a month tier or higher if you're not the link is below and you're more than welcome to join us but I'm not going to go on about that because you can find all the details below and this episode has already been longer than usual so I hope that you enjoyed this week's episode we are doing rural gothic again next week so if you do like folk horror and all that jazz there is a link to that as well, so you can go and check that out in the show notes. And if you're listening to this after the 22nd and 23rd of May, there are replays, so it's all good. But anyway, 
We are going to leave it there because otherwise I will ramble. So I will see you next week when we go to meet Jupiter. Cheerio. Well, thank you for listening and thanks for visiting Fabulous Folklore. I hope you enjoyed your stay. If you did, why not consider subscribing in your podcast app of choice? If you enjoy the show, why not leave me a review and help other listeners to find it as well? And if you'd like bonus exclusive episodes of the podcast, then why not support me on Patreon? It does help me to keep the show going and it means that you get a little bit extra every month as well. And you can find all of the necessary links in the show notes below. So without any further ado, I will bid you adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next.